Jon Stewart of Earth. Who? What? You possess singular will. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. Jon Stewart really is one of the most powerful epic characters ever in the DC mythology. John is the definitive Green Lantern core member among all of them. He's never been out there doing his own thing because he knows how important it is to be a part of something bigger. He's got a symbolic part. It's a groundbreaking part, the first Black Green Lantern. His appearance was truly earth shattering and he really set the template for everything that would happen with characters of color afterwards. That character resonated with a sense of truthfulness in a way that most other characters of color in comics back then didn't. Who's this? Who's this Green Lantern that's like in the inner cities, that's not out fighting space aliens? I'm like, let me read this guy. Certainly, as a person of color reading comic books back in the day, you noticed when there was a character of color. And for him to not have black in his name was like, wow! This one's different. Yes, me being a little chocolatey boy, seeing John Stewart up there flying around with the ring made me feel super powerful. What was interesting about John was that his ethnicity was not necessarily the marquee event of the character. He was a Green Lantern who happened to be black as opposed to a black Green Lantern. He actually had a reason and an emotional depth to in brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power, Green Lantern's light. The concept of the Green Lantern Corps was one that always appealed to me. It was basically an intergalactic police force. And the fact that you see all these really peculiar aliens all dressed in the same kind of iconic Green Lantern uniform really gave it a lot of weight. It was always part of the mythos that there was one Green Lantern for this sector in space. But just in case something happened to the regular Green Lantern, there was a backup, someone as brave as the main guy. Guy Gardner was the backup. The Guardians, the little blue guys, told Hal Jordan, who's the regular Green Lantern, that a guy was out of action. He was in the hospital, and we needed another backup Green Lantern. The little blue guys had picked John Stewart. Hal Jordan, who was a very straight Middle West sort of guy, who probably wouldn't have picked an urban South Detroit black guy to be his backup, but that's what the Guardians had chosen. So a good part of this story was Hal coming to terms with a different sort of person to be a Green Lantern. It was interesting because the whole concept of the Green Lantern Corps was about diversity, that no matter where you were from in the universe, no matter what you looked like, you could be a Green Lantern. And up until the point that Jon Stewart arrived, all the Earth Green Lanterns had been Caucasian. From everything that happened in our country, especially in the 60s leading into the early 70s, it was far past time for somebody like John Stewart to come on stage. 1971 is is just that right time. Here, you know, the black exploitation movement was happening in film. There was more stuff going on in television in terms of black characters. There was this whole push inside of popular entertainment, not just film and television, to have black representation. That was a wonderful time for comic books and and DC in general because they were doing the kinds of stories that had never been done before. The work that Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill did in the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series that began in 1970 was truly revolutionary. People were slowly beginning to realize that comic books weren't just for children. And so I think they felt that they could address more adult, more real world issues. Their run on Green Lantern was, in, you know, it touched upon racism. There's a classic story where a black man is imploring the Green Lantern, like, you did all these things for <laughs> red skin aliens, yellow skin aliens, blue skin aliens. What have you done for the black man? And it touched on drug use with Speedy, corporate greed, and environmentalism. I hadn't seen anything like that, certainly not in DC comics or really any comics at that point. It was like, wow, this is some heavy 70s writing. I love it. 
and Denny and Neil, their choice to create a, a, a Green Lantern who happened to be black, as opposed to wearing that on his sleeve and pimping out his ethnicity, I think was a, a very brave way to go about it because it instilled the character with a certain level of dignity and agency that we did not see in other areas. It was the right talent, the right kind of stories, and the right kind of readership. There have been other characters, but nothing as prominent as a story like the one that introduced Jon Stewart and had such an impact and, and had such great meaning behind it. He had a completely different feel to him than Hal Jordan, who was a test pilot and very noble and very heroic. John was more of a realist, more of a planner, very educated man. John Stewart is a component of the whole Green Lantern, Green Arrow experiment, which was basically Denny going to editor Julie Schwartz, who was a legendary guy. Julie was a traditionalist in a lot of ways. If there's a story that I'm missing that I would like to hear is, is how Denny talked Julie into being able to take Green Lantern, pair him off with Green Arrow, and head off in this direction. It was quite daring for the time. I'm a comic book fanboy, and one convention I got to meet Neil Adams. He proceeded to tell me his stories around the creation of Jon Stewart, how he had to fight to have the name Jon Stewart. It's like, no, oh, no, you should be like Lincoln Washington or something. You know? <laughs> he said they even was a controversy over the color. When he submitted the pages, he had coded the color, you know, the brown he wanted to use. And they're like, and apparently at that point in comics back then, black people weren't brown. They were this sort of off gray thing. And they said, Neil, Neil, you messed up. You put the wrong colors on here. <laughs> He's like, no. That's the color he should be. That's the name he should have. And he was right. Neil Adams is, is one of those artists who is really good at drawing different ethnicities and different races of characters. When I looked at Neil Adams' drawings, and I still look at them now of Jon Stewart, I'm like, okay, yeah, Neil Adams must have known some black folks. Because there's always like those those artists that would draw a black character in comics, and it's like, yeah, no, this this does I, I don't know what you're drawing here. Neil Adams had some great rendering, and that was the thing that was interesting during that era, is that he brought this this specific style that was so much more expressive and really bringing characters to life in a way that we hadn't seen in generations before. I remember one particularly iconic cover, which is where Hal Jordan is unconscious and Jon Stewart is, is kind of holding him by the scruff of the neck and he's got his ring up ready to defend Hal. And it's such a wonderful thing of a military man defending and fighting for his fallen comrade. And it encapsulates so much about Jon Stewart. One day I'm in the comic book store and I see this cover and there's poor Green Lantern and he's got the crap kicked out of him and standing over him is this very angry black man in a, in a Green Lantern costume. I'm like, well, that's gonna earn my 15 cents. I think comics were going through a period as much as society was back then and the comics reflected that desire to bring societal change. And so obviously introducing black superheroes into the mythology was paramount. I think he was born out of necessity to honor truth. And I think for me, that's what Jon Stewart represents. In the 70s, yeah, it was brave, <laughs> you know, but it was necessary and it was natural. The great thing about comic books, and particularly this run where Jon Stewart was introduced, was they can be more than just stories about superheroes and supervillains fighting. They can be about our world. And I think the best stories are metaphors. You know, they're symbolic of what we're going through as people. Because America is such a unique country, with such an incredibly complicated history, it continues to evolve. And if you look at the comic books, their stories got more sophisticated and more real, more grounded. And so they evolved with the country. Our heroes evolved with our country. And they started to tackle issues that our country was tackling and telling young readers what these issues are through these superhero stories. So Green Lantern 87 in 1972 was an important story for a lot of young people. First of all, let's look at the way that he was introduced and, and how forward thinking that was and how relevant it still is today. In the very first panel, he's introduced as arguing with the police because they're basically harassing a couple of people in the neighborhood. When you flash forward to today, it really becomes a fascinating story of, of civil rights in this country. What I noticed that was so different about Jon Stewart was he was a black man in more than just color. He had an attitude. 
he was grounded in reality. And I think that had to do with the storylines that Denny O'Neill and Neil were doing at that stretch. It's like, they were mirroring our society. They were basically breaking all the rules and in a way paving the way for everything that DC was going to do after that. They were way ahead of their time. After creating Jon Stewart and introducing him, he didn't get used again for another 12 years. He was part of a revolutionary effort that they were making to shatter the limitations of everything that DC had kind of been held back by up until then, and really ushering them into a new era of comic book storytelling. It was a truly momentous occasion. It was a huge change uh, for DC. I think DC uh, lagged a little bit behind its competitors in, in introducing more diversity in, in its superhero ranks. And so Jon Stewart was a great way for the DC Universe to begin to diversify and bring a character into one of the major franchises. When you think about the Green Lanterns, they are up there in my mind with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash. They are the big seven that constitute the Justice League. So Jon Stewart emerges in the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series in the early 70s, and then he's kind of off the board for a while, and then he's brought back in later on, and he has appeared ever since in different iterations and different evolutions of the character, as is typical of superhero characters. When I was first reading the comic books, Dave Gibbons was drawing Green Lantern, and when you looked at those pages and those issues, there was something so deliberate about the way Dave drew it, much like John is so deliberate about what he does and his constructs and the choices he makes. And so Dave's art really matched John Stewart. And that to me was, that was a magic era, those issues. One of the things I was really interested to see when I went back and looked at the comic where he was first introduced, which dates back to the early 1970s, was that he refused to wear a mask. And I thought that was a really interesting thing. I think John Stewart was about authenticity and honesty. My first issue of John, it had a cover that was John being carried on the backs of like uh, civilians and he was taking off his mask and just pitching it. After that run, I don't think John's wor ever worn a mask again. If you look at the two most prominent Green Lanterns who don't wear masks, there's, there's two. There's Guy Gardner and there's John Stewart. And they both do it for a very different reason. Guy Gardner does it because he wants the credit. John Stewart wants to do it so people know who he is and he represents his community. Because John is is comfortable in his skin. I mean, he he's got nothing to protect. He's 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 a Green Lantern through and through. He not only did not have a mask in our run, he didn't have gloves. And I think that that would sort of symbolize his connection to his surroundings and that he was sort of a for lack of a better term a man of the people. I had him say in one of my stories that if I'm doing something that I need to wear a mask, I shouldn't be doing it. He's somebody who acts with integrity and stands behind his decisions. He's somebody who doesn't have to hide from what he does. It played toward Denny and Neil Adams' sense of, in the real world, would he wear this silly domino mask? And I don't think it had anything to do with the character being black. I think, again, it spoke to his individualism and spoke to his personality as a character. Well, when I was growing up and started to collect comic books, it was right when Crisis was happening and right when Jon Stewart took over being Green Lantern. And Jon Stewart, to me, was so interesting because he was an architect. And I thought that was fascinating because an architect's mind has to think every detail through, every piece of something that's built, they have to know how it works and why it works and how it's gonna work. You see a lot of the inner workings of something, right? Uh, most of the constructs that Green Lanterns make are sort of the surface look of a fist or a tank. With Jon Stewart, he would actually go in and do the rivets and the inside of the turret and all the foundational elements to make it whole and real because that's the way he thinks as an architect. He would use that ring to create anything you could imagine, but his mind was so intricate and so detail-oriented and not just like buildings, but people and society. Jon was really a deep thinker. John was somebody that had a depth that I think someone like Hal Jordan, who just kind of runs in and does his thing, didn't have. John really thought, he, was just, he just felt like a very stoic, deep thinking character. I felt like the version that we did in Mosaic was a much more intellectual kind of a, a take on the character. I felt like he was more introspective. He was much more accepting of like the bizarre, the absurd. 
you know, there was an interest in jazz, you know, literature, history, you know, that sort of thing. That was a little bit more of a personality than I think that I had seen on the character before. A, a little less reactive and a little, a little more active in terms of like who the character is. In the intervening time, I think they've sort of played up more kind of the military aspect of the character, the former Marine kind of version of the character. A Marine mindset is to get the mission done. You have to think not 10 steps ahead, you gotta think 20, 30, 40, 50 steps ahead, right? You're constantly playing chess and you're constantly having to beat your own self at chess. And what I mean is beat your own fears. And at the end of the day, your safety to a degree takes a step back, you know, in relation to the mission, in relation to saving lives. You're willing to sacrifice yourself if need be at all costs. The Green Lanterns as a concept, their powers are derived from willpower. That's what drives their ring. For Jon Stewart, he's somebody who has a tremendous amount of willpower. And I think that's born from that responsibility that he feels when you're dealing with a character like Jon who does have a military background and is in a leadership position and does have this tremendous amount of loyalty towards his other Lanterns. I think you can see where he would find that will to dig deeper and make those constructs last. The base of their power Though fueled by willpower, the base of the, the, the extent of their potential is tied to their imagination. What can you create and how fast can you create it? You know, when you're in a jam, how fast can you think? So you have to be quick on your feet. You can't be burdened or fettered with, with distraction. So as a Marine and as an architect, I think those backgrounds help shape his mindset for doing what he's doing because he has to be able to build and construct a world in which he can constantly win because at the end of the day he's just got to bet on himself when you were looking at john stewart it was compassion because this guy is dripping with it this guy has empathy for everybody because of what he's gone through and i love john's stories with kat matui so that duo that pairing was so interesting because not only did he introduce a different perspective to hal and the core on earth but also introduced what earth was like to an outside person like Kat Matui, who came in and didn't understand the nuance or complexities of Earth. And that relationship was really important and became romantic and eventually they, they married. And then at some point they killed off Kat Matui, which I never liked because I thought that was such a strong relationship. I was writing the Green Lantern feature in Action Comics Weekly and the only thing memorable about that run was that I had Star Sapphire kill Kat Matui in a, in a very unpleasant manner. And I just want to go on record saying, Denny made me do that. That wasn't my idea, and, and I didn't really didn't want to do it. But when you're a young writer and you're lucky to have this gig, there's not too many principles you want to stand on. But uh, please don't blame me for Cat, but that was Denny. But that partnership, for me, was such a definitive part of who John was. In Cosmic Odyssey, he takes on the responsibility for the loss of an entire planet. For someone like myself, there's a different context to that because Jon Stewart's one of the only black superheroes you're seeing, and suddenly he has this tremendous flaw, this, this tremendous loss where he should have had a victory. It was very seldom that you would see Superman with that kind of loss or Batman with that kind of loss. But when you have a Superman, when you have Batman, when you have all these other characters that are white, a loss means something very different to them and to the readers that relate to them. And so it was great that they gave this character some true nuance that, that a lot of comic book characters don't have. But it's also like, oh man, like why did it have to be the black guy that let the whole planet die? Show us an image of the accused. He's a native of the planet Earth. The Green Lantern, known as Jon Stewart. As somebody who loves comic books and has a passion for them, as much as, you know, I think comic books introduce the characters to everybody, really something like an animated series reaches such a bigger audience. So when they did Justice League and they introduced Jon Stewart as a Green Lantern there, it hit an entire new generation. People who didn't read comic books watched that show. Better late than never. Comic books were for nerds <laughs> and TV was for everybody. In my mind, that's really when Jon Stewart really became something. And that's how it is with a lot of superheroes. The moment they go to other mediums, that's when they really come into their own, especially if they're not top tier. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. For that time, it was great to bring a character who had a little back history, 
but someone we could, you know, mold a little more and make our own for the purposes of the show. Got your back. Bruce, Tim, he was running the show. When he said he wanted to use Jon Stewart, he tasked me with coming up with some designs. It had a futuristic quality that I don't think the other Green Lantern costume didn't really have. All right then, enough talk. Let's mobilize the core. I doubt these amateurs can hold their own against a few thousand Green Lanterns. It just, he struck me as being a more interesting personality. There's a diversity of temperaments and, and of personalities on the team rather than just all, all being of one ethnicity. He was on the team initially because we did want diversity. We didn't want him to just be a black Green Lantern. We wanted him to be a Green Lantern who happened to be black. Well, well, the great and glorious Green Lantern. Would you run out of alien menaces to beat on? You got a horn in on my turf? You're welcome. Phil Lamar created a, a character with Jon Stewart with his voice. He demands attention and he demands respect just in his presence, in how deep and resonant his voice is. Aren't you going to put those on, John? <laughs> Has the shower been invented yet? Somebody should tell this guy. Bruce's character designs, where everyone has these massive chests. When you have a resonating chamber this huge, your voice has to be deep. And it's funny because it wasn't just, you know, my voice is Jon Stewart. You also had Kevin as Batman. Diana's carrying a grudge. She'll get over it. And there were many times you'd have Clancy Brown. It's back to business as usual. You'd walk into these recording sessions and even if the mics weren't on, you'd still hear the voices through the bottom of your feet. <laughs> there was a lot of bass in that room. I'm telling you, Jean, it took all the restraint I had not to part that guy's hair with my ring. He's got such a dignified and recognizable voice that you just kind of feel. And the voice is also a part of what builds and creates the character that we know. So the character that John Stewart that I know is, you know, Phil Lamar. My job was to bring to life the words on the page. And thankfully, that group of writers brought multi-leveled and textured storylines and character personalities to a comic book show. This isn't right. When we traveled to the future, we met my son, mine and Shaira's. We're supposed to be together. It's our destiny. One of the reasons why Jon Stewart is so popular is the seminal work that Dwayne McDuffie did on Justice League Unlimited. Dwayne just heard John's voice in his head. He knew how to write a guy like John. He seemed to give the, the right kind of dialogue that was tough, but also had that sense of vulnerability in it. The fact is he just elevated everything he touched. That guy was just golden. He was so smart and so creative and one of the absolute best writers I've ever worked with in this business. Shayar, I wanted to Judas Priest. Problem? No. No, it's just, uh, I've never seen you in a dress before. You don't like it? It's, um, uh, fetching. They took all of the best elements of the characters, of the world, of the stories, and so you got the best version of the Justice League. As an actor, it was a dream to play. Part of that was Jon Stewart is the Green Lantern of Earth. For the much larger audience, Jon Stewart is Green Lantern. And what the hell is this now? That is your Green Lantern Corps uniform, Green Lantern Jon Stewart. We're telling a story from scratch that does not bring much of the baggage of what's gone on before with the character, especially since we're telling an origin story. Stop! Stop! This is the first time we, that as far as I know, that we actually do this cinematic version of an origin story instead of a 20-minute TV episode. So it's got a lot more scale to it and scope. Ring at 100% power. Of all the hokey, lame-ass things. Since the animated Justice League series, we haven't really touched on Jon Stewart. So I, I definitely thought it was a really good time to bring him back. When I read it, I was so inspired by it. I was like, this is the perfect story to have him come back on. It touches a little bit on Alice in Wonderland and Apocalypse Now at the same time. How often do you say you combine those two into one movie? Question, can any of you get this ring off me? I'm very glad to get the chance, along with John Semper, to explore him in a feature role 
which I think he is long overdue for and richly deserves. This film is coming out during the 50th anniversary of his first appearance. As a black writer, I am excited to be involved in co-writing with Ernie this particular reintroduction of the character to the world. Who are you? How did you get our friend's ring? My name is John Stewart, and if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Aldous Hodge, he has an authority in his voice when needed, but also a natural humanity. That's why I think he was the right choice voice actor. At no point, I think, in John's mind is, does he say, I'm a superhero. He's a human, he's a man, and he knows he doesn't have all the answers. Where do we get to find those opportunities with this larger-than-life scenario? He's all these cool things, but he still has challenges. He's still a regular brother out there just trying to figure it out and keep it together. We get to really push the humanity parallel to the superhuman, and we get to bridge the gap and show where they are one and the same. We're all forced to do things we don't want to. We can't beat ourselves up over it as long as we do them for the right reasons. It isn't just a straightforward John Stewart. It was a little bit of pain underneath all of it. You could hear it in every line, it was there. You could see that just transfer from the voice records right into the storyboards. It helped again make the story what it is. If you look at John's story in our movie, it's not a wish fulfillment movie. It's not like, oh boy, I wish I was in his shoes. The last thing you want to be is in his shoes. What was it that caused the war between Thanagar and Ran? Ranian treachery, of course. His voice was so present that I, I bought everything because he just embodies this. I guess I stopped thinking about the actor and just started thinking, Ooh, what happens now? What? The only thing that I have in my mind at that time is don't mess it up. You want to live up to it because this is big shoes, big body. The work to fill, man. You made me realize the Green Lantern Oath isn't just some silly rhyme. It means something after all. I hope more people, when they hear the name Green Lantern, John Stewart's what they picture. He's a character that has really risen to the top ranks of the DC mythology. I would love to see that continue and to see other creators of color come in and add to the mythology of Jon Stewart. It's vital that the stories reflect the times that we live in and have the ring of authenticity that our fans crave. And I think that will ensure that he has a very strong and healthy future. There's no limit to what Jon can do and what his assets are and what he can bring to the table. So I would say the future of him is going to be bound only by the people that write him. I think a lot of writers look at this character and go, okay, you could do so much more with him. And it's just more to be done, not because he's a black guy, but because he's a Green Lantern. And there's so many tremendous storytelling opportunities. The color yellow is the one thing your ring power is useless against. Yeah, the ring told me, but I've been up against that kind of barrier my whole life. It hasn't stopped me yet. John's place in the animated universe is on the rise. People talk about a trinity, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, but John now as the main Green Lantern, it really should be a quad. John's legacy is, I think it's yet to be really written because I think we're just on the edge of Jon Stewart becoming one of the most recognized and celebrated and beloved superheroes, not just for DC, but for all comic books and all genre. Do it, kill him! No. I've had enough killing. To me, John's legacy mirrors the phrase on the Dwayne McDuffie Award for diversity in comics, from invisibility to inevitability. And John went from being a one-off little side character of color to being an integral part of the normalcy of the superhero world. Now, when people think of the Justice League and superheroes and Green Lantern and a cosmic warrior, his face is in that image. We have yet to discover the full range of his untapped potential. And I think where he stands now is a gift box for us to continually unwrap. So I say, let's keep unwrapping and peeling back those layers so we can see who Jon Stewart truly is. We've only gotten a small taste of who this beast of a, of a hero is. I want to see the full picture. I'm pretty confident in saying that as long as there is a DC universe, Jon Stewart's going to be front and center. <laughs> Thank you.
Congratulations, hero. You're a Green Lantern. <laughs>